Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Angel Road Outdoors, the podcast. This is episode 37, and I am your host, Brett. I am joined tonight by Matthew Hudson of Hudson Outdoors. How are you doing, Matthew? I'm doing great. How are you? Wonderful. Thank you so much for, um, you know, getting back to me on Instagram and and setting aside some time in your life to uh, to chat with old me here. And uh, I really I'm, I've been looking forward to this for a really long time. Um, you know, I wasn't sure we were going to be able to do it um, just because it seemed as though maybe you were on a social media hiatus and kudos to you for that. Um, yeah. but I was like, man, maybe he'll never get this, this, uh, IG message, but I'm glad you did. And I'm glad you're here. So why don't you take some time and, uh, as much as you want and introduce yourself and your page and your family and your life and whatever else you got going on, whatever you want to share with us. All right. Well, um, I live in South, Southwest Missouri, Southern Missouri. And, uh, I just have been hunting a long time. And ever since I was just a little kid, and uh and uh, about four years ago or so i started deciding that i was going to start filming my hunts and uh, i really was just doing it for fun and i got lucky and was able to kill a few deer on film and so i just started putting it on youtube and it just kind of started getting bigger and bigger and so it's just something that i really enjoy and i just love to hunt and ever since i was a kid i guess um when i was 11 years old my dad got me this old browning bow and i mean it was it was i mean it was a junky little bow but it was he got me i was able to pull about 45 pounds at 11 and i practiced well dad set me in this pine tree he got he hooked me all up to the safety harness got me up in this pine tree and he actually set like five yards away from me in another tree so instead of us sitting in the same tree and the very first time i get up in this tree Within 15 minutes, this doe walks right under me. I pull back, shoot it, and I kill a deer. Like, <laughs> my very first time. And so, you can imagine, after that, 11 years old with a compound bow, I don't even know how the arrow pierced the deer. That's how <laughs> junky the bow was. <laughs> and uh, I killed my first deer at that. And so then, as you can imagine, I'm hooked. So, ever since then, I have just been I, – we, I hunted all the time. And uh, so that's kind of where it's at. And now I'm, I'm getting close to 40 years old. I have three kids and I'm married, but um, I, I still just hunt all the time, going out of state trips. But that's kind of a little bit about me, I guess. Man, I love that. And, you know, I was going to ask you, my next question was going to be, how old are you? Um, just to kind of get that, that trajectory of your, when you started and where you're at today, but you answered that. And I think that's really fantastic. You look uh, very young for your age. So congratulations, whatever you're drinking down there in (laughs) Southwest Missouri is working. Um, Yeah. The three kids hasn't stressed you out too, too much yet. No, I got great kids. I'm, I'm actually 37. So no, I, I got, I got, um, I actually start. Well, I mean, nowadays it's not really starting that late, but I, my oldest is eight and my youngest one is three. So we're, uh, we're just getting with it. Matter of fact, my daughter just, I just got her, uh, she's shooting the crossbow really well. And then I just got her to shoot. I got a, just a little, uh, uh, basically it's a pistol AR, but it's, um, it has that stock on it, you know, so it's a real small AR and she, uh, got to shoot it the first time a few days ago. And so she likes that too. So hopefully I think they're going to get into it pretty good here in the next few years. Yeah. Um, and what's, what are the ages of your kids? You said eight. It's yeah. I got an eight year old, a six year old and a three year old. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I got a, a nice my, my daughter's yeah. Daughter is the oldest. And then I have two boys. So awesome. Yep. Yeah. That's yeah. really great. Do you still have that first bow that you got? No, I, I so, yeah, I know. And I so bad wish I had it. I, I was there. I was, I, may, I was making fun just because it was so, well, really I wasn't pulling that much weight and I sure. say it's a trashy, but it probably actually wasn't that trashy for that time. Uh, but yeah. Browning, they don't, they don't even make bows anymore. You yeah, know, so with what they know. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but they, but that's, I remember it plain as day. I mean, I practiced a lot with it, but Honestly, I don't know how, I mean, the deer was close to me when I shot it and I had practice, but like with 45 pounds and then, you know, the newer bows, if you're pulling 45 pounds, that arrow is still getting with it pretty good. Oh, yeah. But back then, 
I'm telling you, it did not shoot hard. I don't know how I even hit the deer, but I did. I hit it. I hit it pretty decent, but it was a little bit back. But what was hilarious, the deer just took off on a dead run and just ran straight into a tree with the arrow and it just ripped the side of the deer. Oh my <laughs> so, so, so then, I mean, it, it so died violent. pretty quick after. I know, especially for our, it's so funny. And too, as a kid, I wasn't like, I don't know what my, that didn't freak me out at all. I was just like, this is unbelievable. <laughs> I, I guess even from a little kid, I was a killer. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, let me, here's, here's the million dollar question. You know, you go out on your first sit ever at 11 years old. And what did it look like for your future hunts? Was that, was that, did that sort of get you, get you a false sense of maybe what it was really going to be like in the woods? Did it, did you struggle after that? Or were you pretty su routinely successful? I was, well, I, actually I went from the very beginning when my dad would, it was just, I, it's almost like it was meant to be my very first turkey hunt. I killed a turkey. The very first hunt I ever went with my dad, he killed a buck with his gun. Like I just went out there and sat with him. That was before I killed that one with the bow. So it was almost like every time on the first time I would kill something, but yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't like a, it wasn't just like every time I go out, I'd shoot a big buck or nothing like that. Like I never really killed. I killed like a decent uh, 10 pointer. It wasn't huge, but a decent 10 pointer when I was probably 13 or 14. And besides that, I never killed a buck that was okay. deep, even nice until I was 20 something, you know? So, yeah. so I didn't really, but also, so my dad, he, my dad has a, has a lease <clears throat> and, and so on this lease, that's where we grew up hunting and everything like that. Well, my dad was never really like, he didn't like, he wasn't honestly, he just wasn't, he didn't learn a lot about hunting. He just, and his dad never took him on him. So he just kind of learned it on his own. And so what he would do, uh, we would, he, we would go on, this is how he hunted. We would go on a ridge. <laughs> we would like, it was all wooded. So big hills and everything down here in Southern Missouri, kind of like the Ozark mountains, just mm -hmm. big terrain hills. And we would go in the woods We'd walk ridges until we found a bunch of sign. Like we'd find scrapes and we'd find rubs and everything like that. And you'd be like, well, there's deer going through here. Let's hang a stand, you know? So that. it wasn't like, yeah, yeah. And it wasn't like, um, you know, it wasn't like, oh, this buck is bedded right here and he's coming through here and this is a funnel. We literally just said, okay, there's a bunch of sign here. So we're going to hunt here. And, you know, that worked. But it wasn't like nowadays where you have all of these ideas about all these different ways you can hunt and where, right. you know, specific bucks and everything like that. So I really wasn't trained on how to kill big bucks. I just was trained way. OK, here's sign. This means there's bucks around. Probably. Let's see if we can kill one, you know. Mm -hmm. And even back then, I mean, I the, like I wasn't even paying attention to the wind. I, mm -hmm. I, I literally was just going out there. I just loved it so much. I would just go sit. I, it did not matter what if what the weather was, how hot it was, nothing. I just go out and sit because, you know, I wanted to hunt. So I, I dad really didn't train or teach me a lot on um, specific things in hunting, you know. It's but I always. Though. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to say, I, always, con, con, I was going to say, conversely, he also didn't just sit a field edge and say, hope they come by, which I think yeah, I, yeah. I tend to hear that a lot from that particular generation. You and I are very close in age. I, I feel like that generation probably grew up sitting field edges and said, well, the deer typically will come out here and I'll blast them when they walk out the corner of this field. So that, I mean, to me, I think it's, it's really great that you grew up hearing at least how to read the woods um, instead of just here, sit here. Cause I said so. Right. Right. Which yeah. and my dad had killed uh, bucks, you know, with honestly, there wasn't fields. where we, <laughs> So it's not like he could really do that. We were hunting in the woods. And so we had to learn, you know, we learned some terrain features and things like that. Okay. Deer come through here. So it wasn't like it was the worst where he's just like sit down, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I did learn some things, but I got way more into it once I got older and started to understand. And honestly, the same as what you were saying, like YouTube, I started watching these other guys and I'm like, I'm an idiot. I didn't understand that. And then I just kept learning and kept learning. And of course, podcasts. Yeah. And it just made me better and better and better because I already like my thing was if I saw a deer or uh or uh, had an opportunity, I was the type of guy, I was like, I am going to kill this deer. Like I was, I just wanted to, I had all this, I would work as hard as it, and everything. But then, and I, but I didn't have knowledge. I just sure. knew, I was like, there's a deer, I'm going after it and I'm killing that thing. 
But yeah. then I got the knowledge, which made it even better. You know, it made me be able to kill better, you know, and be able to track down bigger bucks and everything like that. You know, the more I learned. You became lethal in the woods. You, yeah, after you, after the knowledge part. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Well, you but, know, we talked, you just touched a little bit on YouTube. And I, and I did tell you this before we started recording today. Um, but I'd like to say it here as well. You know, you were, so I, a lot of people that have listened to this have heard me say that I, uh, injured my right at the time dominant eye and had a detached retina like six times in 2001. And part of my healing process required me to be face down on a massage table so that the oil bubble in my eye would hold my retina in place so that it would reattach itself. And while I was doing that, I was watching a lot of YouTube videos. And this is where I learned people filmed their hunts and had a great time doing it. And one of the people that I stumbled across was Hudson Outdoors, Matthew here. And um, I watched as much as I could of your stuff because you were really on another level uh, considering what I had experienced doing. I had made a decision to hunt Kansas that year. And you are over in that area. And um, I was going to be hunting public, which is something that I was completely unfamiliar with. And I really, this is going to sound weird, but I fell in love with how passionate you are about everything you're doing. You wear, you wear it on your face like you do not have a good poker face. In case nobody's told you, you ain't hiding nothing. Uh, I can tell when you're, you are so genuinely happy when things go your way and you're frustrated when things don't go your way and just seeing you the way that you are very genuine on your films, I re it really resonated a lot with me. And, and that's really one of the reasons that I wanted to have you on here is because a you're killing it out there. Uh, you have a great um, YouTube page and product and you just seem like a really great person. And so tell us about Hudson outdoors. Well, I appreciate it. Um, so like I had, I had told you, well, what basically what happened was I, when I started, I started just basically, I was like, I'm going to start. I, I saw people on YouTube already start, you know, filming. And I, I wanted to do that because uh, it's just something that I was, I liked the outdoors so much. I'm like, I'm going to carry this camera with me. And at that time, I mean, literally I was just carrying around like a little, I can't, I think actually it was a Canon, like just a, I mean, it was a time, you know, it wasn't a very good camera, but I didn't even care about that. I wasn't planning on like making some great, I didn't even know how to really like how to do intros and how to make a good story and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the more I did it, the more I realized, cause it's easy once you do it once and then you watch the footage and you look at it and you're like, this is awful. Like I would listen to myself talk. I would be like, this is the worst video I've ever seen in my life. Like literally there's a matter of fact, there's a bunch of old videos that I completely took off my YouTube because they're so embarrassing. I mean, it's just, it's so bad because you, I, I would sit there and I would hold the camera up and I would tell them what I'm doing. And then I would shut the camera off and be like, that made no sense at all. Like I, I, that made no sense, you know, and it was just the worst videos ever. But the more you do it, you know, you learn what works and what doesn't work and what makes sense and how to tell a story. So you know, they started to get a little bit better and it's still not where it needs to be, but you know, that's kind of what happened. And I started going out there and the thing about it was, it was kind of lucky. The very first time I started carrying a camera with me, I went to Kentucky and I went to Kentucky and I had an unbelievable hunt and I killed a nice, a nice buck in Kentucky. And I got that all on film. I barely missed the shot, which is the story of my life. Every time I film a, a buck, I shoot it. And I'm always, it's like three steps out of frame. And uh, then that same year, as soon as I got done killing that, or maybe it was right before that, I went to uh, in Missouri. I filled my Missouri tag, and I filmed that as well. So my first two, when I carried a camera, the very first two tags I had, I killed nice bucks with my with my uh, bow. And so I put those on YouTube, and that gave me just more of a passion because I had so much fun. Like after that, I loved it, and just being able. Everybody knows this, but it's a ton of work, but being able to show your family, being able to show your friends and bait, look at this buck I saw, or look at this buck. And even now there's bucks like that. I haven't even put on my YouTube channel. Cause I don't want people to know about them, but mm. I can show my good friends and my buddies. I can, I, I still film them, you know, they're 200 yards out in the field and I, I right. can't shoot them, but I can film them and show them. And so that's just kind of, that's the passion of it. I just love it. And now I'm getting better at filming and I, 
just I've killed more deer and I don't want to not do it now. And I'm like, I told you before, you know, it's, I don't, it's not that I ever, uh, I don't, I, I, I'm not doing it to get famous or anything like that. Like I'm not consistent in my videos or anything like that. I'm not, that's not what it's about. I just do it for the joy of it. And I know there are people that enjoy them. And I also want to try to teach any, I mean, if I can maybe educate somebody a little bit on, you know, different things they can do on public land, because that's what I focus on. I, I don't hardly have anywhere that I can hunt. That's uh, my own property or private land. That's almost all public. So um, I enjoy doing that as well. Yeah. So if you could pick like, you know, again, this sounds like there's a lot of passion here. If you could pick one nugget to share with somebody who's on the fence about whether or not they want to start filming their hunts, what would that little nugget of advice be? Well, uh, I would say that you, what I had said before, the number one thing is having that because those memories fade. So the number one thing to me, the reason I love it, just matter of fact, probably about a month ago, I pulled up one of the old, an old fishing video of me and my daughter. And that was when I first started. And like I said before, the video was awful, but it was so wonderful because I had forgot about it. Like I did not even remember taking her on that fishing trip. And then I have that. And so, and it's same thing with my deer hunts. Like I, I, it's not like I'm just sitting here watching Hudson Outdoors. I don't do that. <laughs> I'm not so so arrogant that I'm like, this is the only videos to watch. But whenever, you know, if I forget something, I'm like, hey, there was that one buck in this spot or whatever, then I can go back and I can watch that. And so I would say the number one reason to do it is those memories. Um, but there's a lot of positives. Another one, a great positive is if you do get your shot on footage, it makes all the difference. Um, being able to see where you hit the deer and rewatch it and whether or not if you made a good shot or if you didn't like knowing whether or not how long to wait, things like that. But mainly it's just, I, the number one thing about it is the memories to me. I think that's, if that's what I would do, but uh, you know, I also want to say too, most people, they get, they spend all this money and they get ready to do it. But I'm telling you something, it is so much work because I, for instance, I'm walking in on public land and basically every trip i'm carrying an extra 15 pounds on my back compared to what i would normally be carrying Mm -hmm. um and so that it's a ton of work so most people they're like oh it'd be so cool to get film hunts or whatever you know and then they go and after they try it one or two times they're like this is for the birds because it's so (laughs) much work carrying that stuff around because you know which a lot of guys if they just do a gopro or whatever that's fine. That's not that difficult. But like, if you're going to film with a regular camera and have a camera arm and you really, if you're going to have any quality at all, you have to have that, you know? And so, but it's a lot of work, but like I said, the memories, you cannot beat that. It's just wonderful. That's a hundred percent accurate. And, and, you know, I specifically want to say, and I've said it already that I made a conscious decision last fall to leave my camera in the truck one day. And I shot a 160 that day. Oh my it was, goodness. it was, I was, I was running late and it was like, it was going to stress me out to the point where I was going to not enjoy myself. And so I mm-hmm. made that decision to leave it there and I got out there and it was the biggest deer of my life. And I would 100%, I, I can, I can replay that memory in my brain and it is vivid, but I would love to be able to watch it on film today. Right. Um, Cause one of these days, the old ticker is not going to be as crystal clear as it is right now. And uh, it certainly would be amazing, but you make a great point. If you're going to do it, do it, stick with it, get over that hump. And uh, it'll be, and it'll be a 100% worth it. Um, You know, you had also mentioned that you don't have a lot of videos on Hudson outdoors. Um, And I had mentioned that I reached out to you and, and then you were sort of non-existent on social media is, is social media breaks are, do you take a lot of breaks from social media? Is it just not your thing? Well, no, uh, uh, not too many, but uh, just recently I decided to get rid of a lot of it and not really do it. I don't hardly get on there at all. Um, and honestly, it's mainly, I am a very, like I have a business and everything like that. And so I'm a very busy person. And the main thing is it is such a time waster. Like I want to accomplish things in my life. Like, Right now is my busy time. I'm I'm trying to make tons of money because I'm telling you, here in about another month, I'm doing nothing but hunting. Like I ain't working, I'm hunting nonstop. And so I need to accomplish the things and I have a lot of things going on in my life. And I just recognize like 
it's just, it's too easy. And every, a lot of people say they don't struggle with this, but I don't care who you are. It's too easy to come home, sit down and be on Instagram or TikTok or whatever you're on to be on there for two hours or an hour straight. And it's such a waste of time. And that was the main thing. It's not like, you know, there's too many things that, that I'm against it. It's just, I just, I, I just get, I just log out so that I don't even, when I click on literally your mind, this is what your mind does. If you've ever done that before, your mind will still click on Facebook or Instagram every five minutes and you click on it and then you'll realize you're not logged in and said, Oh yeah, I'm not supposed to look at this right now. Cause it's a waste of time, but you'll do it. And so that's the main thing. It's not, you know, I just want to accomplish more things in my life and I've recognized how much time I waste on social media. And I just, I want to try to stop that so I can accomplish more things in my life. You know, I, I love it. It's a hundred percent accurate. Yeah. And I think there's there are people that are in our generation have a tendency to recognize that. I think people of a younger generation have a tendency to just accept that it is part of who they are generationally. Um, mm -hmm. Do you ever get I'm trying to think of the best way to word this? I know you are not pushing your pages and your content to to get to a, a specific level of anything. I, at least I don't think that. Are you right. concerned that due to inactivity, you will and correct me if I'm wrong. Do you have aspirations to take your stuff to another level? And if are you concerned that inactivity would prevent that or prohibit that? Oh, I know it does. Okay. I know it does because I don't. I don't. I mean, you can look on my Instagram, even on my Hudson Outdoors. I I bet you it's been two months since I've even posted on there. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, I might have posted a story or something, and I try to like certain people help me out like trophy line and other ones. And I will yeah. repost their stuff or I will, uh, you know, uh, I will, uh, you know, whatever they put out, I will try to help them out, you know, and, and sure. post the stuff. But besides that, you know, I, I don't, and I'm not, I am not a big, uh, poster anyway. Like some people, their personality, they want to post every day and it's not even hard for them, but they just want to be like, I mean, they can just post the most random thing. And when I post something, I want it to be quality. I don't want it to be embarrassed. I want it to be something good. And so I don't just, I just am not, I just have not been time. But for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, it does affect me. Yeah. And I just let it go because, or, you know, it affects my numbers. I just let it go because it's, it's not worth, you know, it's just not worth it to me to get these big numbers. Now, I would be happy to get be better numbers. Like I would be happy to, uh, I would be happy for, all of a sudden one of my videos to hit 500,000 views and I get 30,000 subscribers because that does happen. Like sure. I would love for that to happen, but I'm not just pushing and pushing and pushing for it. And one of the reasons why is honestly, so if I'm going to use this as a business, uh, I can, but these, unless you are uh, these big TV guys or these big YouTubers that have 500,000 subscribers, you don't make much money anyway. That's like right. these company, these companies are not giving you very much money. I can make so much more money, money going out and doing my business or whatever I do, you know, I, more. And so it's not, the money is not even that big of a deal, but it is nice to, it, it is nice. At least you get, you would get more uh, uh, sponsors and free stuff. Sure. That, that makes <laughs> a lot more, of sense. The yeah. more numbers you get, you know, and I, but, and honestly, like, for instance, on my Instagram, I don't know how many, I have just over a thousand followers. I think that's all I have. Well, on YouTube, I'm close to, I think it's like almost 5,000 somewhere in there. And, um, I, my YouTube does way better than my, any of my social media. Like there's way more people that watch my YouTube, like all my views on YouTube, especially deer hunting, which I got to where I ain't even post anything else but deer hunting because that's the only thing people want to watch. Mm -hmm. So I post, I post on YouTube. And then that's what helps my, no and my numbers go higher and higher and higher on that. Mm -hmm. But honestly, I'm not that good at social media. I'm just not, I just don't do it very much. I'm not that good at it, but it don't bother me either because I'm not, like I said, I'm not trying, I'm not trying to be some famous guy or get to 500,000. Now I wouldn't bother me to get that. Like I wouldn't mind it, but. Yeah. Well, I mean, it sounds um, like you got your perspective. You got your your priorities in the correct spots. You've got a, a yeah. family. You've got young kids. You know, you're working. You're hustling. You know, you're spending those hours of every day that you're sc mindlessly scrolling with your thumb. You're spending with your kids. You know, like that's mm -hmm. that's the re reality. Is I was just curious. That the reality is that's the correct, in my opinion, that's the right way to do it. So so kudos yeah. to you for that. Um, tell let's talk about your out of state adventures because I, I know for. 
a fact that I have watched some of your videos where you're traveling out of state where, and specifically, I think um, my mind always goes to Arkansas. Is Arkansas okay. one of the places you've hunted? The, actually, last year was the first up. year I'd hunt. No, okay. no, no, I hunted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I've been there. I've been there twice. One time I went with a buddy, and then this last year was the first time I actually bought a tag there, which is kind of funny because it's only – I don't live very far from Arkansas. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the thing is, is I – I, uh, the tag is pretty expensive for out of state mm. and you don't have, um, the, the deer aren't that big there, okay. you know? So, I mean, there are areas there's big deer. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying the majority of the deer are smaller in the area, you know, that we hunt. So it's the, I just don't, I like going after bigger deer. So it's just, I don't go there very much, but yeah, I went, I've been there, but I actually, actually haven't traveled as much as some people. So I've went to, I've hunted Kentucky. I've hunted Oklahoma. I've hunted, uh, uh this year i'm going to kansas i've hunted of course i've hunted elk in montana i've went to wyoming and hunted elk but i'm trying to think of any other states that i've been to but i haven't really been to very many i've hunted with buddies in illinois uh but but that's about it so i haven't really been too many Still places a good amount yeah yeah are, yeah are you satisfied with that do you have places that you long to go to uh not really well iowa i want to go there so i got to get the points to do that you know and that's what i'm working on but but besides that not real there's nothing like specific that i want to do i've just been taking one state at a time because i want whatever state i go to i want to kill in so i can mm -hmm. say i killed a deer in this state this state and this state and that's just for fun so yeah um i'm gonna i i do that and matter of fact that's what i was going to talk to you about it because this is the first year I drew Kansas, so yeah. I'm going to Kansas, and I know you've been you've been there twice, right? I went to my first two years applying. I drew a tag. I went to in two different zones. Yes, right, two right, yeah. Yep. So I later I needed. To, I'm going to talk to you about it because Absolutely. I'll let you know what I'm doing and where I'm going, and I want to get yeah. some advice from you. Um, but I'm excited about that, especially where I'm going there. I'm I'm super excited about that. But so. I have been to Kentucky uh, twice. I've killed two bucks in Kentucky. Th that was my first kind of out of state deal. And what I did is I had some, basically I killed a deer in Missouri and I was like, where can I go? Well, I had a buddy that lived, uh, some friends that lived in Kentucky. And so I was just like, I called him. I said, Hey, do you have very much public land around where you live? And they like, well, let me check. They sent me some places. I mean, this is, I didn't, I don't even know if I had Onyx or anything at that time. And they <laughs> sent me some places. I looked them up online. I was like, oh, these look decent. I'll go. And I went and I had one, I had some of the most incredible hunts ever. Matter of fact, the video on there, you'll see uh, the, my video of uh, Kentucky, the Kentucky buck in, in, uh, on YouTube, you will see how many bucks I saw. It is wild. Mm -hmm. I, it was, it was incredible, which it's not like that anymore because okay. this was like, this was right before, this is four or five years. I need to think, I wish I knew the exact year. I need to look, I can find it, but I just don't know it in my head what year it was. But this was kind of before the big public land craze thing, you know? So sure. there wasn't actually that many people there. So it was killer. Well, we went back several years later. <laughs> it was way different, but <laughs> yeah, I went there, but, but yeah, I love going out state. And like this year I'm going to Kansas and then, I'm going to, I'm going to go to Colorado and elk hunt, and then I'm going to go to Kansas. And normally I just try to do at least just two States until I kill something. But if I was to kill something early, then I'll jump somewhere else. But most of the time I just do one state or whatever a year. Nice. That's amazing. So yeah. do you, do you think of uh, Missouri, especially your area, like Southwest Missouri, do you think of that as a destination state? Do you think people think of Missouri as a destination state? Oh, for sure. But not where I live. They really? think, you know, mid, mid to Northern Missouri, you know, and the reason is there are, there's big deer here, yeah. but not only is there big deer here, the tags are so cheap. I think okay. you can still, I think it's two, $287 and maybe it's went up some, but last time I checked out of state, 287 over the counter. Man. Well, you can't do that anywhere anymore. Like it's cheap and there's bigger deer. So like, I, for instance, I killed uh, in uh, Arkansas this last year, and that tag, to me, Arkansas is not near as good of a state as Missouri as far as bigger deer, anyway. Mm -hmm. And it was five hundred, I think, somewhere around five hundred. And Kentucky, Kentucky is uh, five hundred. Of course, Kansas is five, all of them are five six hundred bucks. And Oklahoma just right, Oklahoma was three hundred bucks, so it was close. <laughs> it, and I they just. Saw, rate, yeah. <laughs> like crazy what did it go to seven something 
Yes. Well, that's only, I think it's 500, but if you want to hunt the walk-in, which is what a lot of people hunt, yeah. they charge you an extra 200 bucks. They're charging, uh, and they're charging in-state guys a hundred bucks to hunt it as well. So even in-state guys have to pay a hundred bucks to hunt the walk-in. So either what's going to happen is either the, the land that's not walk-in is going to just get blasted with people. Mm -hmm. So, or you're going to spend the extra money and maybe there won't be as many, but there's still enough people to have money. People will still spend 700 bucks because it's a fun, I, I've been there two years in a row and I'm telling you, it is, it is so fun to hunt out there. It is a blast. Yeah, I, I've heard that. I've watched a couple of videos on some guys that have had some tremendous success in Oklahoma. I feel like I've listened to a podcast about Oklahoma and the guys were like, man, we got to shut up about this place because as soon as the secret's out, it's all over. And it sounds like the yeah. secret is out because that is yeah, yeah. outrageous. You got That's it, right. insanity. It, it is. It is. It's crazy how much it went up. But there was even the secret's been out because, I mean, we're, when we were hunting out there, even this last year, we had a phenomenal year. Mm -hmm. My cousin, um, and that video is probably one of the latest videos on my YouTube channel, but my cousin killed a super nice buck and they snuck all the way, which we were hunting in the plains. There's no trees. We're literally just walking. We're getting on top of glassing knobs and just watching for bucks chasing does. And we try to bed them and then sneak up on them. And he did that. And it was a, it was a super buck. And um, that was such a fun time. But there was a lot of people out there. I mean, we had the – but the best thing – and I've heard you talk about this, um, about Kansas as well, and that's one of the things I was going to talk to you about. But, like, on the Weehaw land, a lot of times, if, it, if a, especially unless it's just a huge piece, if one person's parked there, a lot of times, unless everything is booked up, you know, if you have one or two trucks there, people normally keep driving, you know, right. because they're like, this place ain't very – and it's the same thing in Oklahoma. Every once in a while, somebody will still come in on you if you're parked there. But most of the time, if you can get there first, and if you have two trucks or if maybe if two people are there, that's about all. That Nobody else will come in on you because they don't, you know, and it's it, where we were hunting anyway. It was wide open. So it's kind of, yeah. it's not too bad, but there's a lot of people out there. Yeah, for some reason, Oklahoma's not been on my radar. Now, I'm not going to lie. Missouri's on my radar just because, you know, driving from Kansas you know, back home, you would go through that Southwest, like the Joplin area and then start yeah, yeah. over to St. Louis and that, that terrain there. And the, which is where I think you're talking about where you're at yeah, yeah, is yeah. gorgeous. Like I, it seems like yes. I probably live there. It's so beautiful. Um, yeah. Yeah. So Missouri is definitely on my radar. However, I do have a close friend who went, I think he went in the rut last year, sort of on a whim with a buddy. And I think he went to public and it was just, pounded with guys and he's like i'm never he said i'm never doing that again yeah so it sounds like um, some areas get really hammered oh it all does and if you go and honestly this is how it is in most out of state if you go to public land, I say everybody wants to go on their vacation and they want to go in the rut which i understand that's fun yeah. to go but that's where every, when everybody goes so yeah. if you go like the end of october or anywhere in october there won't hardly be you can go tons of places where nobody's at but if you go when it's the rut it's wild i mean there's people everywhere yeah so um how do you think we're gonna do you think that will ever go away i i, I think i do th i mean i it's not gonna completely go away but i do think it's gonna go away and i think it's already starting and the reason why this is just my own opinion on this the the public lean craze is already start it was a fad okay and and we were in the middle of it about two years ago, but it's already starting to go down because you even these public lean guys, the guys like on YouTube and that make the videos, they, all of them are talking about now. They're all like, man, we got to find us some private to hunt. They're all because they're all wanting to go back to, you know, getting land where they can grow, you know, mm -hmm. get back, because it's this up and, you know, it's this bad thing. You know, it's like. When, when the hunting public just went crazy and then, you know, like the element guys and all these other guys, when those numbers just went nuts, everybody was like, oh, well, they're just doing it on public land. Let's just all go. And it was just this huge thing. Well, now, because of like what you said with your buddies, there's still guys, they're going in this rutcation and there's people everywhere. And so they're like, this ain't no fun. I don't know why we decided to do this. And I truly believe it's kind of going to go on down a little bit. You know, the only thing that's stopping it this is my opinion. The only thing that makes it uh, not slow down is when they, they can still continue to watch these guys kill these giant bucks on public land. And that still makes people say, hey, 
you know, I saw this guy kill this giant buck and it still makes them want to go, but I still think it's going to, the numbers will go down a little bit, you know? Yeah. So let me ask you this with the rise in costs to lease land and the uh, lower availability of permission options and the increased pressure on public lands, you have this sort of area in the middle where people are being driven out of public and driven out of high cost leases and permission. Do those people that go in the middle, do they, do they quit altogether or do they, do they suck it up and lease something? I, I, I don't see, I mean, I, you, I mean, you understand this. Every person's different. It totally depends like what type of guy you are, but like a lot of the people that are just kind of, uh, on the fence hunters, you know, they like to hunt, but they're not crazy about it. They're quitting. I mean, you have to have a passion for it because it's not fun. I mean, if you're not wild about it, like we are, like if I go to public land and there's people everywhere, that's not, I don't care at all. I'm like, well, let's go somewhere else or let's try it anyway. Like I just love it so much, but other people, if they're not crazy about it, they're like, this ain't no fun. You know, I don't like trying to do this. So you know, it totally is. the bit, And I really don't know the answer to that. And I know there's a lot of p people worried about it, you know, and worried about how that's going. And I understand that. But like, like, for instance, the leasing thing, I just don't get it. I mean, I don't know how it is where you live, but like here, especially in like northern Missouri, Missouri, I got a buddy that lives up there and he owns some farms and he leases some of them. And farms are leasing like the average price is 30 to $50 an acre. Okay. Say 50 so yeah, 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 yeah. So you're talking about, I mean, you know, if you want to get a hundred acres, even you're still spending five. Grand. <laughs> you know? And it's and just... to be clear, it's not fifty dollars an acre of woods. It is fifty dollars an acre, whether there's a damn place to hunt on it or not. It's right, right. What you know, they, I'll I I'm on um, base camp leasing, and you know, yeah, I do look at Michigan farms, even though I have it's I have it pretty good over here. But I look at yeah. these farms that are going up, and they're going fast, and they're let's call it 160 acres and there are seven acres of woods yeah it's like thirty five hundred dollars and i'm like yeah in the hell just happened and it's gone <laughs> it loosed up that fast so right, the right. people who are desperate to find quiet places to hunt whether it's oh, alone yeah. or with their kids and that's sort of that's the simp you know the the sympathetic part that i bone in my body is like Man, let's say you got a kid who's really interested in it, but you know, do you dare take them out to public land and have it ruined for them on their first sit? You know, somewhere right. beyond the youth hunt, or do you do you lease something that's outrageous so they can have a peaceful attempt at seeing something? I mean, where that's a right. that's a really fine balance there. There um, is, yeah, and and it also makes a difference too. This is something that. Like I am blessed, but there's some, like, I don't understand all of it because there's some people that just live in awful places where there's not, right. there's not land. Like I live in Missouri, but like we have all of our conservation areas, but then we have Mark Twain national forest. Okay. okay. So that's, that's Missouri's basically it's the, uh, it's, um, not state, but federally owned, you know, Mark Twain, it's national forest. So it's federally owned and they call it Mark Twain's if it's in Missouri. Well, Mark Twain National Forest, we literally have I, – I wouldn't be shocked if there's 200,000 acres of Mark Twain spread out everywhere. Yeah. So, like, I have – there's two separate places within two hours of me, hour of me, where there's 30,000 acres and another place where there's 20,000 acres. And that's not counting all of the conservation land. That's not counting the lakes, which is Corps of Engineer land. So, mm -hmm. if you go to certain areas, there is so much land. Like, I'm telling you – like early season, especially now gun season, you cannot, don't matter what you do. You can't, you're not getting away from people. I have never seen a spot where there wasn't somebody during gun season, but bow season, I never see people. Like oh, I sure. don't have, I mean, I, I see, I, I mean, every once in a while, some, I might run into somebody, but I do not see like this deer I killed in Missouri last year. I shot him. I when I hit my rangefinder, I was 48 yards from the gravel road. Literally, people driving back and forth on the gravel road. That's how close I was. I hunted that deer over and oh, I hunted. I didn't even in the YouTube video. I had five encounters with him before I killed him. That I actually got footage of him, and uh, I I 
I hunted him almost every evening. And so what I would do is I'd work in the morning and the way he was bedding, I didn't want to go in there in the morning because I thought I would spook him. So I would only go in the evenings, went every evening. And I never, and that, that deer, he was, he was in hay fields where that's how I saw him. He was in a hay field right next to public land before season. And I never saw a soul hunting him, not one person. Like there wasn't a single person ever that I saw that was hunting in that area at all. Like not one person. So that just shows you there are areas like everybody says, oh, public land is so crowded. And I understand maybe you live in a bad spot, but there's other places. And I know other states that are like that. Like Arkansas is the same way. Like there is yeah. not people. There is so much land to hunt in Arkansas, but it's just hopefully you live close enough. You can go to them because if you don't live by anything, you it's impossible. You know? Yeah, there's um, there's an incredible amount of, of public land opportunities here in Michigan as well. The, the trouble is you you really need to get a little further north to, to really get into the, the 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 vastness of it and then when yeah. you do that you start to get out of the big the big buck territory which is right. you know the big sexy thing for everybody to do these days right. but, you know I think w- what I'm hearing you say and what I think I hear a lot of guys say is a little creativity a little hard work um, and a little persistence will put you in the game if, if you're willing to do it. And right. it sounds like uh, systemically, uh, most guys are not willing to put in the work. Um, there's yeah. a select few people who are willing to really boots on the ground, be a little unconventional, dig in, dive in, go, you know, think outside of the box. And uh, I'm going to wonder, I'm going to see if how many cliches I can use in one sentence. <laughs> I'm going to stop that, that one. But, you know, I mean, you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, and I think I, what I was going to say is another thing too, like you're saying, think, but honestly, some of these things are so easy and I want to give, I, let me tell people something and it, I know it don't work for everywhere, but I want to tell you one of your best tools for public land that by far, and I don't hear, I know I hear some people talk about it, but not very many people. I'm telling you the biggest tool for public land is your vehicle because all these people, they, they just go to a spot, they see cars and they just go ahead and go hunting. Well, there's so much, so many other places you don't have to, st- you need to drive. And cause there's places where there's not people. I, I think even in gun season, if I was to drive around enough, maybe eventually I'd find an area where people weren't hunting, mm-hmm. but people literally, they say, okay, I want to go to this spot or this spot. And then they go there and there's people everywhere. And they say, Oh, I don't know. And that's what you're talking about. All these cliches, like they're not thinking outside the box. They just say, Oh, well I got this spot. I want to hunt and people are there. And so, I can't hunt it. And now I don't have nowhere to hunt. Well, there's tons of places to hunt. You just need to get in your car and take off driving, you know? And, and another thing too, I understand as well. And these pe- people use this as, as an excuse and it's true for some, and I'm not saying it. So one of the reasons I'm can do this and I'm able to do this is because I hunt a lot. Like most people can't do that. Like I'm not that good of a hunter. I just go a lot. <laughs> if you go a lot, you're going to kill something. I mean, I'm not, it's not like I'm some spectacular guy where I go out for one day and I see a giant and I just go and shoot it. It's like, I put a lot of time and a lot of uh, sits or scouting in. And so, you know, if you don't have the time, you can't do that. And that's the problem. Guys are like, well, I have like, you know, five days to hunt. Well, I need to be in the stand. And I understand that. You do, and so they can't just drive around, or they don't feel like yeah. they can. But if you have any, like, evenings, any time to drive around, that is a huge benefit um, to hunting public land because you can find areas where people are, especially if you go during a time where people are hunting, like in the evening um, or the mornings, you drive. Well, th- to me, it's worth it even just to do that for the – even during the good part of hunting because then you're seeing where everybody's hunting, and then, boom, you know, hey – nobody's been in this parking lot. Well, let's try that because nobody's here. So let's try it, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. And, and honestly, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the off season, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, you could be going into places that you've thought about and either saying, this is absolutely someplace I need to get to, or man, I'm glad I came here crossing this one off the list. And so instead of uh, it being your five days to hunt, and you're going, man, I have 20 spots, but only five days to hunt. And I don't know, have any, I don't have any historic information on these things. At the very least you can do is some preseason scouting to, right. to eliminate, go from 20 to 10. And then you'll mm-hmm. have 10 spots. But like you said, take one night and drive every parking lot. Find the one that there's the fewest amount of people at. 
That's such uh-huh. a simple trick that most guys are probably not doing. Cause like you said, I got five days. I got to be butts and seats. Right. Right. And I understand uh, like, for, <laughs> like already. And I know there's guys that's done way more than this, but I have already went glassing and driving around five different times. We're in July. It's not even August yet. And I've already right. drove five different days. Like I've already seen giant bucks already. So yeah. just putting in that little bit of time, I'm already understanding, okay, well, I know there's some big ones over here close to this private public land, you know, so mm-hmm. just things like that, that, that makes all the difference in the world. But people, I don't know, they just, they get their mindset or maybe they e-scout or something. They get their mindset on this one spot in this one place or whatever. And then everybody saw that on the map. So they go there, they see five cars in the parking lot and then they're like, well, I'm done here, you know, and oh, I, yep. You got to, you, just like you said, at all, with all the cliches, you have to think outside the box or it's just not going to, it's going to be tough. Are, are, are you a, are you a big off season scouting person? Um, Quite a bit. I let, I didn't do it near as much as this year. Like last year, I don't know how many miles I put in, but um, so I do like on, on uh, Mark Twain force on national property in Missouri, you can put trail cameras, but not on, uh, not on conservation land, I, not on state land, but on, on federal land, you can. So last year I had like, uh, I don't know, I had like 40 trail cameras out that I had put out in like July. So I went walking. I mean, I had them all over on properties all over the place. Yeah. And this year I haven't, I haven't done that as much. I kind of already know. One of the reasons is I kind of already got my goals set on where I want to, what I'm going to do because I just know some places already. Cause I've done so much work in the past. Right. It's getting to where it's kind of paid off for me to where I don't have to do as much as what I, you know, did. And it might not pay off. See, I might not have as good of a, or have as many bucks located if I don't do that. And, and I will get some cameras out, but I just haven't, but I, yes, I do scout and I go out and I look for, you know, I, I, I make scrapes in the summer and put sin in them and put cameras on them and try to locate deer ahead of time, you know, to just get the areas. And it's not too, uh, not necessarily. I all I'm really doing. I'm just trying to see what areas have the type of deer that I'm after. Because once I find one, like mo- the last few years, I've just been after specific deer. So I see a hmm. deer, or I see one on my camera, and then I'm like, okay, this is the buck I'm after, and then I go after him. Now, sometimes, like I try to have two or three of those deer that are that I want to hunt because if one falls through and I can't find it, because you know, uh, Missouri starts September 15th, and so. Okay. During that, in that range on September 15th, normally in that range, that's when the deer are starting to move locations. You know, they're starting to change spot. So this is what happens. I find this giant buck in the su- summer and I follow him, follow him, follow him. And then all of a sudden he disappears. Now I know he's probably within a mile to four mile radius somewhere, but sometimes he's off of public land and he's not close and I can't, or I just can't find him, which happens a lot. You know, you find this big buck and you're like, I'm going to kill this buck. And then he's gone. And so I try to have several different options so that I can maybe go after another one, you know? Yeah. Um, um, but- that's interesting. You say that. I, so I agree with you. I, I agree with you. However, I will say this year, I have already noticed a shift. So okay. I had some cameras up in some history. I have, I have a specific camera up in a specific area where I located my big buck last year and I, I, I went out this spring and I put a solar panel up so that I would not have to go back um, and left the camera in the exact same spot. And there were no bucks there all spring. Now there are bucks there almost every single day. And um, in Ohio, I have some cameras out and I was getting absolutely nothing on camera. And suddenly I'm now getting bucks on camera almost every single day. So something wow. has, something has shifted. And now this is, these are both in ag country. Uh, one is sort of lowlands. One is sort of in uh, more of like uh, ridges and draw steep, real steep draws. So, so two uh-huh. varying terrains, both in ag country though, but the deer have started to shift a little further back into the woods. And so I, I, I sort of feel like I'm, it's early this year. Yeah. Um, well, cell cameras or uh, SD cards? Mostly SD cards. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I have a few cell cameras, but I don't use them very much be- just because they get stolen, you know, so I just don't. 
it's expensive to replace those. So I just have, I yeah. literally just do a bunch of cheap stealth cams and just the cheap junky ones. All I care about, I don't care how good the picture is. I just want to be able to see the horns and see how big it is, you know? So, yeah. uh, but, uh, now I, you know, I've noticed this and it's totally different, but you, you know, just like you probably, you understand this, but bucks are so different. All bucks are different where some, you know, move a bunch, some don't. And some, I mean, some will, their range is a mile. I mean, they'll go clear over here for a week and then come back for a week. So you just never know mm -hmm. on the shifting, but like the deer I killed last year in Missouri, um, you can see it. I was in, in August, I was filming that deer out in that hay field from the gravel road, literally just driving by and just filming it. And he was in the, in, in the private land on private land, in a field right next to the public. And so he was coming from the public to, well, he never shifted. He stayed there. I killed him October 6th. So October 6th. So I was filming him in August. He never moved. He stayed there the whole time. And not everybody says, hey, they shift in September and they go somewhere else. Well, listen, that's there, didn't. He stayed there the whole entire time. And I have proof of it because I have footage of him in August and I have footage of him in October when I killed him in the same spot. So oh, yeah. that shows you that, all deer are different. Some might shift forever away and never come back. And then some, you know, and I know that's true as well, because, you know, you, I've had cameras in the same spot forever. And I've got a picture of one deer, even when it's not, and I'm not even talking about rut. I'm talking about getting a picture of a buck and being like, Oh, look at this buck. And then have the camera there for three years straight and never get him again. Like you just don't know. You're like, what in the world? Like, where did this deer go? And why was he here in September or mm -hmm. whatever? And then I never see him again, or I never sp spot him, you know, and that could be a lot of things. Maybe he died. I don't know, but I'm just saying that all bucks are different. So you never know, you know, you don't want to, you want to keep, when it comes to hunting, especially bucks, you want to keep an open mind to all these things that you hear. So I understand. Yes. Deer shift. That's I, I believe that I do think they do, but on, Every deer, you want to try to keep a somewhat of an open mind about, well, maybe this deer's not doing that, or maybe because if you just follow what everybody says, you sometimes that's going to mess you up. You know, it sometimes it works. That's why I said you have to keep an open mind about it. I'm glad you said that because you said something earlier, and I thought you were going to go. I thought you were going to go somewhere with it, and you didn't. But I'm going to go there now. Um, when you are going to a, when someone is going to go out to a public piece of land, and they've got let's say they've got their mind made up about how this public land works. And they think that this, that these guys are parking five trucks to this lot. They're getting out and they're following the trail and they're going all the way out there. Okay. Maybe they are, but maybe one guy doesn't maybe one guy. And so I guess what I'm getting at is I think when you approach a new property, you should not have your mind made up. You should be open. Right. Like you just said, you should be open to everything and i've heard people talk mm -hmm. about walking the perimeter walk that perimeter get a look at the perimeter first and then work your way in specifically i'm thinking of an experience here where the most sign i found at this particular public piece was 10 to 30 yards off of the main parking in a swampy little area super dense i just there was a some guy shot a deer and and you know he, he deboned it and then dumped the carcass there and so i walked in to see it and then just made my way through that crap. And as I'm in the crap, I'm like, holy smokes, the sign in this. And you could, mm -hmm. if you peeked around one autumn olive bush, you'd see that the cars parked there. So, so don't just make up your mind before you're there because you will walk past something uh, thinking it doesn't make any sense. So like you said, be open-minded. Um, I think it'll really, it'll, it'll do you a lot of favors. Yeah. And I, the, you saying that made me think of this as well. So another thing is too, like these, you see this property, it looks so good, even on that, or even when you drive by, it looks so good. And so in your mind, you automatically say, this is where I'm going to kill them. This is going to be fun. This is where I'm hunting. Well, then you go walking around and you don't want to see no sign, but in your mind, you always said, well, this looks perfect. They have to be here. And so you hunt here. So because of my YouTube channel, people message me during deer season, like uh, these people message me and say, Hey, and they, they ask for advice. They say, "Here, I'm hunting here. They'll even show me where they're hunting. I'm hunting this property. I came here from Georgia. I came here from wherever, you know, I'm hunting this property and they send me a map and they're like, I seen a scrape here and a deal here, whatever, you know, but there's a guy sends me where they're going and everything. And he's saying, Hey, we, uh, we have came to this property. This is where we're hunting and we're just not seeing any deer. 
nothing like this. And they're three or four days into their trip. And I'm saying, if you're not seeing anything, you need to leave. But it's already in their mind. Well, this is the place we picked. We already picked this spot. We have to be here, you know, and it's the same thing. What you were saying, be open minded because you have to know whether this is a good spot or not a good spot or there's no deer here. You have to you can't just automatically say this is where I'm going to kill that buck. And this is the same thing. It's true. So in the past, I've got pictures of, I mean, ginormous bucks. And I'm thinking I am going to hunt this deer until I kill it and everything. But guess what? Season starts. I don't see it. I can't find it. I've got a billion cameras. I'm trying to find this deer. I can't find this deer. So guess what I do? I don't go after that deer. I go start going after something else because it's just not working out and I can't make it work or whatever, you know? So just what you were saying is uh, that's a perfect example of that, you know, keeping an open mind about where the deer Mm -hmm. are going to be. And just like you said, walking, you might have it in your mind. The only way I'm going to kill a deer is to walk two miles. Well, that's not necessarily true. You know, that's why you have to keep an open Mm -hmm. mind about what, is taking place. Don't just make up your mind before you get eyes on what's taking place. You know, try to, um, try to base your decisions off of what you're actually seeing and what's actually happening in front of you. You know, in, uh, in Missouri, do you, would you say that you find big buck, big buck sign where you find big bucks for, or do you find yourself in an area that has a tendency to hold big bucks And yet you don't find the sign that you would suspect you see. Yeah. Uh, So, well, there's several ways to answer this. Uh, Both of the, I would say the second thing you said is more true, not sign. So, I I mean, I look for, I I look for sign. Of course I do. When I'm going, I'm looking, okay, here's a big rub. Here's some scrapes and everything like that. But I don't, I don't base. um, I'm a different hunter though compared to some people. So I want to be careful how I say this. I don't base any of that off the sign because I know most of the time I want a, a big buck. That's that, you know, it's bigger than normal, the normal deer around in that area. So I actually want to lay eye. Most of the time I want to try to lay eyes on the deer that I'm going to kill. Now, several years ago, several years ago when I was hunting, that's not how it was. I just saw sign or I saw, Hey, there's big deer here. And then I went and I just would shoot whatever. But now that I've hunted and I have more, Um, you know, a little bit more knowledge on how to kill bigger deer or a little more. And I try to, anyway, I try to kill a little bit bigger deer. I look, I try to find that exact deer that I'm after. And so I don't, you know, I'm not, if I see, you know, a place that's just tore up and there's big old rubs in there and there's scrapes everywhere. Of course, this, that gets my attention and I hang up the camera and everything, but I'm not just going to go like, if you're just a, a, a hunter that just hunts a few days a year or just a few weekends, well, of course you want to hunt that because you're not after some specific buck, probably, you know, you're after whatever. So I would pay attention to that even more, but it's the same thing. This is, uh, let me try to make it more clear to answer your question so that I'm not just jumping all over the place. I feel like I'm jumping all over the place. So, uh, there are some deer that are really big that are super aggressive. They make rubs and scrapes everywhere. And then there's other giant deer that aren't aggressive. So you can't base it off that. You don't know. Some giant deer, they're not aggressive. They don't hardly leave. I mean, I saw a a giant buck and a small little eight pointer and they were going through this CRP with these little uh, sprigs and trees everywhere. And just, and this little eight pointer is tearing apart everything. Every tree he runs by, he's just raking it up and down. And I mean, just digging at the ground all over the place. And this big buck, he's just eating stuff and just walking, never makes any sign at all. And he's much bigger. Yeah. So you can't, they, I, what I'm basically, what I'm saying is you can't base all the sign off. And I, uh, uh, also, I want to make it clear too. I'm not saying there are things like there are certain things in sign where you can say, okay, this deer is a little bit bigger by, you know, like if you see, how high the script, uh, the rub is and different things mm-hmm. like that. You know, you can say, or if you see his track in the, in the mud, you can say, okay, this deer is a mature deer because look how big his track is, things like that. So I'm saying you actually can tell that a deer is bigger by the sign, but that just because there's a lot of sign or because there's no sign, that doesn't mean there's not a big buck there. You could go in a spot and they're not, Oh, for instance, the place that I killed the deer in Missouri, I'll give you just an example of that where I was hunting that deer and where he was going through and where I finally found out what he was going through, what got him killed was I found a persimmon tree in there and they were hitting that before they were going. And it took me a second to find that. 
And once I found it, then that's when I, as soon as I found it, I killed him. Cause I knew I said, okay, he's hitting this persimmon tree before he goes, but around that persimmon tree and in those Oak, I found two rubs. That's all two rubs. And that deer was going through there all the time, two rubs. And I'm not joking. They're about the size of my thumb, maybe a little bigger than my thumb. And that buck was going through there and he was a big buck. He was a nice buck. Um, and so that basically to answer your question, after all that <laughs> rambling on, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that you, I would not base whether there's a big deer just by the sign, because sometimes it's not, sometimes there is, sometimes it's not. That's it right there. You cannot yeah. make your sole decision based on whether or not you see the stereotypical sign in an area. You need to be open-minded enough to look for the absolute su most subtle sign you could possibly go and then say, now, hold on a second. I, I, somewhere deep in my memory bank, I've heard someone talk about this faint trail. Maybe that's a little bit 50 yards off of the main heavy worn out cattle look at cattle trail looking that the does and fawns are running like you, you need to find those little ones. And it's funny you talk about that thumb size sapling tore up. I got a, a, a friend of mine, Matt, who is the host of the Mobile Hunters Dojo. And Matt shot a 200 plus inch deer last year in Illinois. And in that area, the rub, I, I swear he said that he was only rubbing saplings that are about the size of his thumb. And, yeah. and honestly, there's something to be said about when you are the monarch, you don't need to lay down a bunch of signs. The mm -hmm. doe are seeking you. The mature doe who want to be bred are seeking you out. The younger mm -hmm. bucks, a, a, a 120 inch basket rack aid is not going to mess with a 200 inch ginormous monarch of a buck. And like, he doesn't have to. Um, mm -hmm. Similar to my buck in Illinois, he laid down zero sign. There was, I, I happened to come across a, 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 a licking branch that was very tall. Uh, in an area that I had no experience on, but it was on a faint trail. I put a camera on it and he was using that faint trail hitting that, but he wasn't doing any rubs and I found no massive scrapes, but he was a big deer. And so, mm -hmm. so don't, again, I think what we're trying to say is don't make your sole decision based on signpost, whether or not there's a signpost rub out in those woods. Um, again, being a little open-minded. I have a question for you. This, this, this came to me just the other day. I asked uh, Matt the same question last night. I'm going to ask you as well. Um, let's say you shoot a pretty great buck somewhere and, um, and you've got a ton of history with him. You've got so many photo, you know, so much, so much trail camera data on this buck. Um, you've studied him from all sides, you know, exactly what he looks like genetically, his antlers, his body, his colorings, and you harvest this buck. And let's just say the following year in the same area, you see a buck with extremely similar genetics as far as antlers are concerned. Do you instantly say in your brain, that's his son or that's his brother? <laughs> I, 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 I say, I'm going to kill that deer. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't really think <laughs> I say, right, I mean, okay. I, yeah, no, but I don't, I, I haven't really thought about, I mean, I'm not really that, uh, I don't know that much about genetics, so I haven't really thought about it that much. I don't know if, uh, I would say, I guess it could be either one. I would think, I guess I'd probably say son. Because yeah. just because, but I don't have no proof of that. Like, I don't know. I was just, I, I'm guessing I, have, I, I would just. <laughs> I've never <laughs> once said anything other, because this happens a lot. We have a, a really nice private piece here in Michigan. And we're constantly going, oh, that's so-and-so's son from several years ago. Oh, that's so-and-so's son. But I just had a deer. So I, I shot that nice deer last year in Illinois. I just had another deer show up like three or four days ago with the exact same antler characteristics, G2s that lean forward and mm -hmm. uh, lopsided crab claws in the front, like in the same exact area, he's probably two years younger. And for some reason, for the first time ever, I said to myself, why couldn't that be his brother? Like certainly yeah, yeah. Doc had a dad and his dad yeah. probably uh, mated more than once. Like, oh, why yeah. do you have a brother that's two years younger than him? And so I just was curious. I think most people say son. 
for some reason. Yeah, I would. I think that. Yeah, I've never even. That's never even crossed my mind. Like, oh, that's that's his brother. I always think son, but I mean, I have zero proof of that. I'm just that's <laughs> just what comes, <laughs> that's just what comes in my head. I don't. I know. asked my I asked my wife that question last night, and my wife is in. Uh, my wife works in the natural birth community, so she's okay. really into genetics and births and babies. Yeah mothers and fathers and all this stuff. And so she's like, why don't you get somebody on your podcast and ask them about that? She doesn't sound, <laughs> she doesn't sound like that. So anyway, she's like, you need to talk to somebody about that because yeah. I'm, I'm legitimately curious. Like, yeah. Do the antlers change more when a buck um, passes on his lineage compared to when like that father, that buck's father was passing down his lineage like, yeah. do, do the antler genetics come from the buck or the doe? You know what I mean? So I was just curious yeah. well, where your brain went on that. Yeah, I have no idea. But I know for sure there's guys out there that know. It. Actually, I've listened to podcasts of guys that talk about genetics like that, like guys that have these farms, especially yeah. the ones that have the, the the high fence farms because they they that's all they care about is those genetics. So I'm sure they would know more about it. But it's true on every farm. Well, I shouldn't say every farm, but it's true. I mean, I've seen that on – like my, my dad owns 80 acres, and it's the same thing. You'll get these bucks, and they look identical. I mm-hmm. mean, you just – you're like, man. And matter of fact, I've seen them look identical, and they they look like they're only – they might be the same age or, you know, a year apart, but they're, they're just – you get certain gene pools, and the horns all look the same, you know, so – that's I just don't know. I got to get I got to get a, 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 a biologist on here and ask some damn yeah. weird questions to somebody. I got to figure this out. I know. <laughs> hey, uh, do you consider yourself a southern hunter? Uh, I, I wouldn't think. Well, I don't know. I guess I would say no. I don't think I would say more of Midwest. I I would consider southern hunters like Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama hunters down there. So I don't know. I wouldn't really consider it because I mean, a lot of the place, places I hunt, you know, is still kind of, kind of more Midwest kind of still, you know, I agree with you. I was curious because you're obviously further South than me. Um, oh yeah. And the terrain is dramatically different down there. Um, again, I was just curious um, if you considered yourself that I don't know specifically where you live, but I, you know, after our conversation today, I'm getting more of a vibe on what it looks like around you. Um, and so I don't know yeah. that I would agree with that either. I just listened to uh, a guy named Kalen Pope um, talk about hunting uh, Alabama and how it was like one of the I think he even made the declaration that it was the most biodiverse state in the in the country. And um, does does is Missouri like that? Is it is it pretty diverse between the north and the south? Is it is it changed dramatically at some point? Oh, quite a bit. Oh, yeah, really? for sure. I don't know. Anything oh, yeah, about. yeah. Okay, so like where you come through, where you were talking about from Joplin to St. Louis, you, you're you yep. on I-44. That's where you're going, I-44, straight up. So uh, when you – I live around Springfield. So you okay. go right – you you kind of – well, I-44 goes right through Springfield. So I live right close to the big Bass Pro, the first Bass Pro, you know, the big one that Johnny Morse – so that's where I, I live in that area. So we live in – people call it the Ozark Mountains. It's not mountains if you go out west. But basically, you know what I'm talking about, big hills, ravines, oh, yeah. you know, cattle pastures. There's a lot of cattle pasture, but it's all hills. There's not very many flat spots. It's all rock. Mm-hmm. And so when you get – you go through all of that. But when you get up to the St. Louis to the Kansas City line, I-70 goes from St. Louis to Kansas City. When you hit that area, all of a sudden it starts flattening out more mm. and there's a lot. Now, there's still some hills, but it starts flattening out more and there's more cropland, more black dirt. Down here, it's all rocks. Mm-hmm. And up there, it's all it's all ag and everything. And that's why up there, there's much bigger deer. So it's like a night and day difference in the deer. Like if, if you can go up toward, like once you get on that I-70, like Columbia, Missouri, straight in the middle where Mizzou is, in between St. Louis and Kansas City. So once you get to that I-70 mark, that's the way people talk about it. You know, I-70 is about the middle of the state. When you get north of there, that's when you get those big, that's where you get to the big ag-type stuff, you know. But 
that is where also, and that's where most guys go when they're mm. coming from out of state. For instance, like you, if you was to come here out of state, you would, if you want to kill or see bigger deer, that's where you go. But the thing is, that's where the pressure is. So, you know, like if you go you, around. I loved it so much coming out of Joplin, headed towards St. Louis, those humongous hills right there. My yeah, yeah. were like, this is gorgeous. Yeah. And it was yeah. Stunning. And, it, you know, it was that time of year where the leaves are changing, like, don't yes, get me wrong. Yes. I, I honestly think I would probably, I love Kansas so much that um, I would probably head that direction, like Southeast Kansas towards Southwest Missouri. I just, that's yeah. where we would go. I think we loved it over there. Right. So, totally right, right. distracted you. No, no, no. You know, it's fine. But you would, if you like that, I mean, there's, that's what I mean. There is, yeah. if you hunted in this area, you would find some great places to hunt and there are nice deer here. They're just not, they're fewer and farther, far between. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you can hunt a lot of areas in the south where it don't get near the pressure, and there's a lot, lot of land. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of land to hunt down here. And uh, uh, most people, this is the problem, you know, the thing. I like it because it helps me, but most people, when they think of public land, they automatically think of the state conservation land. So everybody says, all right, we only have these conservation lands. but And they don't even think about federal land or Corps of Engineer land and all that. So when you put all that together, there's a lot of land, but yeah, you're – you would you would really like it yeah and the chat the tags are are cheap you can come down and join all the rest of the missourians <laughs> and all the other people that come in. <laughs> is uh is you missouri would, a one buck state uh no it's a two buck state yeah. even for and, even for uh for for for, for residents two bucks oh yeah yeah it's residents two bucks i don't know about non-residents i think it still is i think it's a two buck state wow so but i you can only kill uh, maybe Maybe it's yeah. I think it, it is what it is. It bow hunting. It's two bucks, but if you gun, you can only kill one buck. So okay. for Missouri, it's the same. Or for for in state people, it's the same. You can only kill two bucks, no matter what. You can either kill two with your bow, or you can kill one with the bow, one with a gun. Wow. Do you feel like that is a detriment to the um the net the resources the your Missouri DNR for lack of a better word? What is it called in Missouri? It's a. Uh, uh... <laughs> I don't even know. That's neither <laughs> here nor there. We don't care. Yeah. There's not a lot of yeah, facts yeah. on this podcast. So yeah. for lack of a better term, do you feel well, like I'm, your DNR could do a better job of managing oh, the herd? Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I, uh, so I've listened to, and I'm not, I don't know all the facts about it, but I have listened to several podcasts about that. And they're just basically, I've talked to de several different or, or heard several different people talking about it. And there's definitely some things that people can do. And the number one thing they say, this is the number one thing. So all the states that have gun season right during the middle of the rut, that is the number one negative thing. Because what it does is all the young, dumb bucks are running around trying to find does. All the big bucks have the does locked down. And so the young bucks are going from buck to buck. And so everybody's shooting all the small bucks, you know, so that hurts it big time and hurts the numbers. So, mm -hmm. um, but the number one, I mean, for me anyway, I know that would help. And then I know uh, the tags being so cheap is a huge thing too, because I mean, I'm telling you, we get tons of pressure because I mean, nowadays 300 bucks, I mean, anybody, is, if you want to go somewhere, you're going to go, you know, to a place where it's that cheap. There's nobody, there's nowhere else like that. You so, are 100% think, correct. Yes. But anyway. But people, know you know, people who are really eaten up with it, I think, will uh will budget for those out-of-state hunts and so like you said if you raise those prices you are going to get people to still come and hunt but you're going to get mm -hmm. less and you're going to get people who are very serious about it or they're just mm -hmm. rich and dumb uh, there's right even, right right it's a flip of the coin right. there but more right. than likely you're going to get people who are passionate about these the sport and the pastime who are a little more probably a little more conscientious conscientious about um the resource and uh, okay. I think they're going to be willing to pay a little bit more money. You know, you maybe you don't hunt four states that year. You just hunt two. Um, right. I like it. I think that's a great idea. That's something that I don't talk about a lot is, is we ju I just had a, a conversation with some guys the other night about this is, and he said, what would you do differently? If, if it were up to me, like what would I do differently for the state of Michigan? Um, and moving the gun season never even came out of my mouth. And I don't know why it's because I don't gun hunt but it never even crossed my mind. Um, yeah. but ours is well, like November 15th through fricking middle of December. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't even, I wish so bad I could, I wish I could remember what it was, but I, and it's, it was last year, so I don't even know, but it was some podcast and they were talking, literally was just talking about how they could make each state. This guy was on there and he had done all this research. It was super good because he had all the facts and the numbers of the deal of how to make it better. And, uh, Anyway, that was one of he was naming the stuff, and he said that is one of the number one things that kills Missouri uh, is because of that. Because he was saying, so Iowa, Southern Iowa, which has the biggest bucks that kill the biggest bucks there are, and Northern Missouri is so similar. Like it's the same, it's the same yeah. thing. Yeah. But Missouri don't have near the bucks because of that. And basically, he was making the point. It's not that difficult. You can look at the good states and say, look what they're doing, and then look what you're doing, and what you're doing is killing things. And I think one of the, another thing he was making the point of, too, they were trying – I think one of the reasons that that guy was on there, and I was so bad wish I could think of who it was because I could give him credit. But basically what they're talking about – they were also talking about uh, crossbows, you know, because how much that affects, oh, you yeah. know, what's going on. So right. they're – they were just basically making points about that. But I know for sure if we could move the gun season to another time, uh, I'll tell you what we do. Like I, I hate gun season so much. Our, our out of state trip is always during our gun season. Like we go, me and my, my, my cousin films all for my channel and my brothers. So there's four of us and uh, we all go on a, we go normally go on one trip a year somewhere. Like the last two years we went to Oklahoma, but we we go opening day of gun season, and then it's on a Saturday, and then that Sunday we head out and go somewhere because we just hate it so much because it just there's people everywhere. Yeah. But uh, I know if they moved that, that would help the numbers big time. And then I I mean I know it probably would help the two buck, but they did put a antler restriction on the northern part of the state. They don't they I don't think they made it down here in the south yet, but in the north it has to have four on one side, and I think that's helping as far as big bucks, but. A lot of people don't care either about the trophy thing. You know, they don't, they don't, they would rather, they don't care about that. So, you know, to each his own. Do, does Missouri have a rich tradition of hunting, like the hunt camps and the brown it's down? Like, is that, is that sort of the mentality in Missouri as well? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's how sure. it is Especially that. Yeah. 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 There's a lot. I mean, gun season is just a big, you, I mean, I'm, I know you now it's not as much bow, but I mean, gun season is an event like you have never seen. It's just, and they, I mean, like on some of my public land pieces, I call it my, it's not mine, but the public land pieces that I hunt a lot, um, that I found deer, I go in most of the time a week before gun season and I'm starting to get my stuff, make sure my stuff is all out of there. And they're already coming in, setting camps up. You know, I mean, they're putting their tents in. They're getting their, their, you know, and they're getting their stuff set up for gun season. And they have a big old time. And you know, it's 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 awesome. I like it. I'm glad people still get together and do stuff like that. But they, it's a big a big tradition around here. I mean, around especially where I live. Not, I'm I'm sure not in the bigger cities, but I mean, I live in the country. And I mean, that week of gun season, everybody's taking off work. I shouldn't say everybody, but a ton of people are taking off work. Kids aren't going to school very much. I mean, it's just the way it is. Yeah, it's funny that when I meet people who come to Michigan and around that particular time and there's no school on the 15th of November and they're like, why? why? Well, it's it's the opening day of gun season. They're like, what? This is a national holiday? No, it's not a national holiday, but it is in the state. That's funny. Yeah. yeah so we were yeah. talking the other night about how that 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 traditional hunter in your state, the uh, brown it's down, shoot everything, yeah. is is the loud voice. It's the um, it's the people in the ear of the your state's um, game commission, whatever that we couldn't we could never figure out what the name of it. But anyway, like the DNR here in yeah. Michigan, right, right. Um, you know, it's the, it's those old he- they call them the old heads. They're chirping in the ear of the DNR, like you know, don't make too dramatic of a change because I won't be able to shoot my two deer this year, or, you know? Um, and so there's this concern that it's going to continue to be sort of mismanaged until that generation of Hunter sort of, you know, retires on out of the game. And then people, our generation who have a more conservation minded approach to things sort of is the voice in the community. Um, and so it sounds like maybe you guys are in the same boat because I don't think yeah. tags are that expensive either. Um, yeah. 
kind of a right. We're not thought of as a well, destination state, but we have plenty of well, deep. Yeah. Well, I honestly probably ought to study it more and try to get involved a little bit to help things out. But uh, I don't know exactly how all of that works. And I know that like for different laws, like for instance, the crossbow law, you know, where they allowed crossbows. I know mm -hmm. that was a big, the, the crossbow companies put all that money in to get the bill passed so that could happen. So I know the laws happen in that direction, in that way, you know. Yeah. And I don't necessarily think, I don't know exactly how it works. I don't necessarily think that there is a, uh, you know, the regular hunter that just brown it's down is making the law. I think it's just wherever those congressmen and senators get the money, that's what they're voting towards. Or that's the bill they're making is where they're, whoever's getting them the money because that's how they, you know, that's how it works. If that's you get money, it goes. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah. And the guys that are brown, it's down. They're not giving them money. So I think it's just they're sticking with right. it. And honestly, most of our senators and the ones, there's very few that know how to hunt or know what it's like. Yeah. Um, and a perfect example of that is the Kansas uh, 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 trail camera law on the public right. land, a uh, uh, cell camera. Well, I think it's all cameras. Yeah, it's all cameras now. Mm -hmm. Well, if you listen, I listened to some of the, the court hearings. They literally, the, the people that were in charge, like there was a few people that were making their discussion about what, it, but the people that were in charge had, you could tell by the way they were talking, had zero clue. They did not even know, they didn't know anything. And the only thing they were getting told was what these hunters were telling them. And of course it was the hunters that wanted to get rid of the trail cameras. And mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm just saying that I, I don't have an opinion on it. I'm just saying that. The, these senators or whoever they were talking to in the court, whoever it was, they had no clue about hunting. They didn't know anything that was going on. Literally, these guys were just telling them what was taking place. And so I think that's how it is in most states. So it depends on where they get the money and how that works to right. make things better. And I know there's a way to do it because I've heard guys talk about the different things that you can do to help out in that area. So, you know, if we had more people that were um, came together in unity – to write the letters or to go to the people that you needed to go to, that would make a difference. But also another thing too, I am not necessarily, I don't know if it's best to go to uh, an area where, uh, to go to laws to where it's just makes it best for trophy hunters. You know, I mean, I want conservation to be good. Mm -hmm. I want, I want nature to be good, but I, I don't necessarily think that all the laws ought to be, put in place just so people can shoot giant bucks. You see what I'm saying? And I know oh, yeah. most people are like that, you know? Yeah. I think, um, I think it sounds that way to a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. but the, the truth behind a lot of the, you know, I know what you're saying. So the, but the truth behind a lot of the argument is our herd is so mismanaged, um, that our buck to doe ratio is so out of way. Oh, yeah. And, and they're, they're not making it easier to shoot does. Um, they're they've made it easy i'm speaking specifically about michigan they've mm -hmm. made it easier to shoot ant antler deer um they haven't put restrictions on what antler deer you shoot they haven't removed that second buck option they're not making it easier to shoot does mm -hmm. so the reality is the herd is mismanaged but most people here i just want shoot i just want to shoot a big buck every year and so sad mm -hmm. like, it's sadly that's what it sounds like but to piggyback what you said you're right. We got to get more involved. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to have a voice, some sort of a representation at those meetings so that they are at least hearing both sides instead of just who's got the, the deeper pockets. Um, mm -hmm. That's, I think that's as good a place as any to, uh, to kind of bring this thing home. You said you had some questions. Did you want to talk about that afterwards or do you want to ask them now? No, let's wait till afterwards. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, listen, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. We're like 90 minutes already, uh, which okay. I feel like we could talk forever. But um, why don't you take some um, time and just remind everybody where they can find you, where they can follow along. Um, if you want, if you don't want to, that's fine, too. Whatever you want to do, man. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you having me on. I really enjoyed it. I feel like we could talk forever. Um, so if anybody wants to follow along, you can follow along on my main thing is on Instagram, Hudson Outdoors on Instagram. And then, of course, YouTube, if you type in Hudson Outdoors, that I'll be the first one that comes up and you can watch the hunts and the ones 
even some of the hunts we talked about tonight, I'd love it if you clicked on there and watched some of the hunts and you can see from some of those out-of-state hunts. And uh, But that's the two places you can find me, and I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, and I think what I challenge people to do is go watch his videos and just – just smile because you can see the absolute joy in this man's face when he is out in those woods. You, he just, he is lit up like a kid in a candy store. His eyes are wide and he's just so excited out there. It's really infectious. And, um, and you're definitely going to want to subscribe and follow along, man. I, Matthew, I sincerely appreciate you taking time, um, to hang out with me tonight. And I'd like to talk to you more and, and get to know you more over however much longer we do this, but thanks again. And, um, Thanks, everybody, for listening this long. And if you haven't yet, please go over to iTunes and um, subscribe and rate and review us. Even if it's a bad review, I, I'm fine with that. Just be honest. Uh, just give me something. Uh, you can do the same thing at Spotify, but uh, we will talk to you all next week. Thanks.